Good afternoon, everyone. I am Joanne Starks of SEDL in Austin, Texas, and I will be moderating today's webinar entitled Introduction to Reviewing and Synthesizing Qualitative Evidence. It is the first in a series of four webinars that make up an online workshop on qualitative research synthesis. I also want to thank my colleague Ann Williams for her logistical and technical support for today's session. The webinar is offered through the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, KTDRR, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. The KTDRR is sponsoring a community of practice on evidence for disability and rehabilitation or DNR research. Evidence in the field of disability and rehabilitation often includes studies that follow a variety of qualitative research paradigms. Such evidence is difficult to summarize using traditional systematic, review, re, systematic research review procedures. The goal of this series of web-based workshops is to introduce DNR researchers to the methodology of qualitative evidence reviews. Participants will be provided a state-of-the-art overview on current approaches and will learn to apply those to the literature base. Ongoing innovative initiatives at review-producing institutions will be highlighted. Today our speaker is Karen Hannes, Assistant Professor at the Methodology of Educational Sciences Research Group at the Catholic University, or KU, Leuven in Belgium. She has a background in adult education as well as medical and social sciences. Karen currently teaches qualitative research methodology to undergraduates and master students. She has been teaching evidence-based practice and systematic review courses for over a decade, both in public health and educational sciences. Karen is the founder of the Belgian Campbell Group, co-convener of the Cochrane Qualitative Research Group, and co-author of the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Effectiveness. She has published several books and articles on qualitative evidence synthesis, particularly on the critical appraisal of qualitative research. She also specializes in visual research methodology. Thank you, Karen, for agreeing to conduct this introductory session today on reviewing and synthesizing qualitative, qualitative evidence. If you're ready to go, please take it away. Yes, thank you, Joan, for uh, such a nice introduction. So I have indeed been asked to introduce you to the fantastic and exciting world of systematic reviews, and then more specific, the qualitative evidence part of it. So I'll do my very best to give it a bit of sex appeal, and so by the end of this talk, I would be hoping that you would all be motivated to start uh, your own review project. Um, so I just want to outline what I'm going to cover in this uh, particular presentation. So what I want to speak to you about is how I actually got triggered by qualitative evidence synthesis, hoping that this would also lead you into seeing that searching for evidence, looking at evidence, actually has nothing to do with research or uh, science so much but is or should be some sort of a common attitude that people should adopt. I also want to clarify what qualitative research is, and in my opinion, uh, what sort of evidence it may generate. And on top of that, I'd like to show how it can contribute to effectiveness reviews, so how it differs from them, and I'll give a quick but very brief insight in potential approaches that can be used uh, when you consider qualitative evidence synthesis, how you can build your own review protocol, and I will illustrate these uh, things with some work examples. So how did I got triggered by qualitative evidence synthesis? Let's start with the very beginning. It's always a good point to start. Meet Emma. And Emma is the youngest in our family, and I'm going to use her as a case to explain why effectiveness reviews have failed me, and more specific, what has been my worst evidence-based case scenario so far. Emma is actually born on the 6th of October 2010, and is the little sister of Dor and Paula, who you might see on this slide. 
And apart from a lot of joy, she also brought a lot of frustration in me, and I don't know how many mothers I have in the room, but believe me, after having been pregnant for the third time, it becomes really, really hard to control your body, especially your weight, and many moms will be able to confirm that. And so after my third pregnancy, I not only gained six pounds that did not automatically disappear again, but I further gained weight to the extent that I did not fit half of my closet anymore. So I was interested in actually knowing what can I do to actually control the weight gain and actually get rid of the extra pounds. And so if you don't know the answer to your question, think a minute about where you would go look for it. And so I did that and I went looking in the Cochrane and Campbell library to see whether I could find reviews that could provide me with an answer to that query. And I found this Cochrane uh, review on diet or exercise or both for weight reduction in women after childbirth. And the answer to my question from that review was that women who exercised did not lose significantly more weight than women who were in the usual care group. And that sort of comforted me, so it meant that I didn't have to go out running or cycling uh, for the upcoming five months. It also learned me that women who took part in a diet or diet plus exercise lost more weight than women in the usual care. There was no difference in the magnitude of weight loss between diet and diet plus exercise groups. And the intervention seemed not to affect breastfeeding performance adversely, and I thought that was a very important trigger for me. So I found this study in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition uh, stating that those who ate cereals were lower in weight compared to those who ate meat and eggs, bread, or even skipped uh, breakfast. And so my simple logical reasoning actually was that if a diet helps to lose weight after pregnancy, and if cereals have proven to work well as a diet, then actually the consumption of those cereals should lead to weight loss after my pregnancy, right? Wrong! Because it didn't. After having consumed bowels of cereals in several mornings for several months, I didn't achieve any uh, effect. And yeah, that's the moment where you actually start panic panicking and thinking about, gosh, I'm not normal. I'm not, I'm not like this average person where it works. What is happening to me? And, and what am I doing wrong? And I'm not following the protocol. Did I maybe buy the wrong type of cereals? I was thinking and thinking. And then realized that there must have been something that I had overlooked. Maybe there was some sort of alternative explanation for not achieving the effect that the effectiveness review actually had promised to me. And so, Instead of mourning about my weight, I started to go and dig a little bit deeper into a different sort of literature. And I came across a few qualitative articles discussing, for example, the role of social support in weight loss, diet issues, and so on. And also some of the barriers that had been perceived by mothers who engaged in weight loss uh, programs. So I learned from these studies, I learned a lot of things about why I had such a hard time. I learned from the first study that female relatives, husbands, and you know, the, the right sort of people around you were the primary source of emotional, instrumental, and informational support. And having just moved from Australia to Belgium at that point in time, my social network, for example, was really thin. My family was living far from me, and while I tried to reserve some time to exercise, the slots were actually very limited. Only I didn't see that at that point in time. So I learned a lot about facilitating factors for engaging in programs with weight loss. From the second study, 
uh, it highlighted a lot of barriers and facilitators that women had experienced, uh, two of them maybe applying to me. The first thing was the unhealthy eating habit. And because of that statement in the study, I started logging what I actually ate uh, during daytime. And while it wasn't a lot, the, thing, the things I did eat contained a lot of fat, not in the least the cheese platters I was consuming on a daily basis. Secondly, I also suffered from some sort of light depression. I wasn't feeling, feeling good about myself. I was no longer able to hold my breath long enough for diving. I couldn't get my butt off the ground in dance class. And a lot of these, these things actually came together in that sort of situation. Uh, and so I looked carefully at the conclusions of the studies. And they pleaded actually for community-based, family-oriented programs to increase the chance of successful weight reduction, which was not something that I had, uh, had found in the previous effectiveness review. The conclusion of study three, weight loss interventions should address the psychological effects of childbearing, affordability, and perceptions of body image was not something that was particularly taken into account in uh, the programs described in that particular uh, review. And so it reminds me a bit of, of this sort of advertisement that displays a bald, middle-aged man in its, early, in its early 50s with the message, this, and then they're showing some sort of liquid, is the only overhead proven in clinical tests to grow hair. And then if you turn to the next image, then you see the same bold middle-aged man with, with hair growing all over his body, his nose, his ears, his hands, except on his hat, with the message that individual results may actually vary. And after seeing that, I thought this is a perfect example of a wrong effect, but I know now no longer panic because I've learned I may not be that average person, and there's nothing abnormal about that. It happens to a lot of uh, other people as well. So what I learned was that there are different sources of evidence that may need to be considered, and that qualitative evidence had been proven to be very valuable to me to explain uh, a certain situation. Um, this is one of the most famous quotes in the history of systematic reviews. It's Archie Cochrane and the Cochrane collaboration disseminating systematic reviews in healthcare actually named the organization after this person and he stated that it's surely a great criticism of our profession, meaning the health profession, that we have not organized a critical summary adapted periodically of all relevant randomized trials. And while I think that's very true, I think it's also a great criticism of our profession that we have been foolish enough to think that critical summaries of relevant randomized controlled trials would provide us with the right answer for each type of query. Because we already learned that individual results may vary and that RCTs can't explain every sort of outcome. What we now are about to learn is that RCTs are further very limited in the amount of questions they are able to answer as well. Uh, we used to see evidence in terms of effectiveness research. It's often mentioned in the context of trying to establish some kind of causal uh, relationship. And I don't know whether any one of you ever looks at the television series Sherlock Holmes, but Sherlock always goes like, Watson. I know what caused the death. And then Watson, who is down to earth, says then, but you have only administered a few interviews and gone on to site visits. Should you not collect evidence that is more robust? And indeed, if you talk in terms of causal effects, qualitative techniques may be the worst choice to make. But if you talk about evidence in a different sort of fashion and consider, for example, evidence of feasibility, the extent to which an intervention is practical, uh, cultural, financially possible within a given context, then the picture actually changes. Also, when you want to assess the appropriateness of uh, interventions, 
which is the extent to which an intervention fits with the situation, how it relates to the context in which it is given, then RCTs are not able to provide you a lot of relevant information for that. The same with evidence of meaningfulness or the extent to which an intervention is positively or negatively experienced by your target group or how it relates to, to people's personal experience, opinions, values, beliefs or interpretations. So we have long neglected a whole bunch of questions because we couldn't quite fit them into the straitjacket of an RCT. And apart from these types of evidence that firmly link into intervention research, there's other questions we might be asking like what's the evidence of the cost benefit of a particular intervention? Uh, what are the lived experiences of people with a certain condition or living in some sort of deprived uh, situation that we do not know a lot about? Or what actually do people value or not in an intervention or maybe just in daily life? So I always wondered what if Archie Cochrane had thought about organizing a critical summary adapted periodically of all relevant qualitative research studies. Now that would have made a difference because then we might have had about 6,000 mixed method reviews that provide us with a much more in-depth understanding of a condition, an intervention. Not all sorts of questions require a mixed method approach. For example, questions related to understanding the meaning of a particular phenomenon, such as how people make sense of a particular chronic disease, or why they behave or feel the way they do. They, these questions may be explored in a standalone qualitative evidence synthesis. They would provide enough information on their own. But that would be the easy way out, because mixing evidence is really hard. It's methodologically challenging, and we are still working on the development of methods to actually smoothen the integration of combining quantitative and qualitative evidence. And why is that so? Because some people would argue that it's ridiculous to think that that is going to work, that we can just, in fact, mix apples with oranges. But I actually support Jean Glass in saying that it is, of course, about mixing apples and oranges, mixed method reviews. Yeah, in a study of fruit, nothing else would be sensible. So comparing apples to oranges to him would be the only endeavor worthy of true scientists, because, yeah, when you look at it, comparing apples to apples is trivial, in a sense. So in order to, it, to be able to mix different strands of evidence, so in order to have them inform each other, you need to be able to understand what exactly a quantitative and a qualitative study is, and what you can do with it at the meta level. And to my understanding, most of you have already had some sort of introduction in quantitative studies. So my job is actually to reveal a bit more about qualitative basic studies and how they can be, can be used on a meta level. Um, first of all, I think it's an inquiry of meaning. It, it addresses a different sort of questions that go into the what of a phenomenon, the why things are what they are, and the how people uh, cope or deal um, with them. I very often tell my kids the story of the three little pigs, and in case you've never heard about it, it's a story about Mama, P Mama Pig who goes to the market and tells her three little piggies to find some sort of shelter, because there's a big bad wolf running around. And so each of the pigs builds a house. The first piggy builds a, a house of straw, which is in fact the least solid, but the Piggy then has plenty of time to play afterwards. And the second one builds a wooden house. That requires a bit more work, but still there's plenty of time to play. The third one builds a brick house and is laughed at by his brothers because he's all sweating while they are actually playing and having all the fun. And then the wolf comes. He blows down the straw in the wooden house, but he can't blow down the brick house. And that house then gives shelter to the three pigs in the end. And when I tell this story, what occurs to me is that my kids start asking many questions about it, such as, 
Why weren't the first two pigs smart enough to build a brick house? Were they too lazy? Why could Mammy not take them with them to the mar with her to the market? And these are all questions about the meaning of the story. They seldom ask, well, did these pigs really exist or uh, could they really talk with each other? That would be easy because I could answer that with a yes or a no. The other questions, though, they require some sort of deeper understanding. It's what I would call a rich, deep, thick, insightful or illuminated understanding. So many of our kids, many adults, actually see the world in terms of meaning, and that's what qualitative studies uh, try, to, um, try to understand. So looking at evidence, we can look at both strands and how they can inform each other. For example, I came across this effectiveness review on rehabilitation in enhancing community integration after acute traumatic brain injury. It's a systematic review presented to me by Chet Nye, which is one of the facilitators of the series. And this effectiveness review actually found that a lot of community integration programs show positive results and should be studied more rigorously. And the authors actually recommend that to further establish that post-acute traumatic brain injury rehabilitation intervention, in order for them to improve um, community integration, they should think about intervention strategies that are based on injury severity, for example. They should take better care about their control groups. They should engage in longer term follow up. And if you look at it, these are all very instrumental suggestions to actually improve uh, the designs more than anything else. If you then look at qualitative evidence, uh, looking at the same topic of uh, injuries and how people deal with it, then you see that these papers actually look beyond numbers. Numbers are very bad in capturing experiences, nor do they allow us to really conduct an in-depth exploration of a phenomenon. So I came across this sub study from Gauvin Lepage, and it really spoke to me in the sense that it, that, it, that it succeeded in sort of capturing the lived experience of these people and how difficult it was to actually reintegrate. In fact, the difficulties mentioned were not that much related to severity of the condition, which was suggested in the quantitative review, but rather to the response from the environment. And, and this should actually certainly be taken into account when we start promoting interventions for community integration. Because it tells us that one should focus on knowing and understanding what life was before for these people that one should focus on managing the psychological imbalance that this sort of condition actually uh, evokes and on reframing the expectations of the environment rather than focusing on the individual with the limitation itself. Because these are all things that would help uh, people recover their social roles from before uh, the injury. Do you know that famous cartoon where an interviewer goes up to a man in the street and tells him to describe how he feels? The man then actually says, the way I feel is actually hard to quantify. Well, says the interviewer, how hard on a scale from 1 to 10 would that be? So it really shows that if we are trained in a particular tradition of research, we may not have all sort of in, sorts of interesting layers on our uh, personal uh, radars. Um, so another example of seeing what qualitative uh, evidence can actually mean to enrich the insights of quantitative studies is this cross-sectional study from Carpenter that indicates that life satisfaction is more strongly related to community participation than to the impairment itself and activity limitations. And so in the article, Carpenter really pleads for community participation. And that's actually a good thing. Uh, but then again, I found this study from Newman, and I included a short video fragment of it. 
that actually states a lot, a lot of barriers and facilitators of people functioning in their own community that should be taken care of uh, when we intend to promote community participation. And I'd like to look at this video uh, with you. Okay, so at the end of this video, I just want to make or pick up on two uh, points. The first one is that the video really shows that we're actually not limited to textual accounts in qualitative research, that we use a lot, a lot, a lot of our senses to actually um, uh, reach out to what people uh, want to express. The second thing is that it also shows that we can address a different layer of knowledge here on community participation. And it's probably a layer of knowledge that uh, quantitative reviews just can't uh, access. So the next point I want to make is that in line with what Archie Cochrane actually mentioned is that it would be great if we could kind of summarize or synthesize all the qualitative evidence that has been generated from different contexts 
while still remaining sensitive to that context and bringing that together uh, to some sort of, into some sort of new theoretical or practical insight. So uh, what I wanted to present next is a short definition of qualitative evidence synthesis that we came up uh, with in our uh, Cochrane guidance chapter on dealing with qualitative research. And actually, it is a process of summarizing qualitative research findings by comparing and analyzing textual, visual, or other sort of research evidence. It might even be performance or dance-related type of evidence. It can be derived from multiple accounts or, or, or just one event, one phenomenon, or a situation. And the important thing is that it has to be reported in basic qualitative research studies. Why am I saying this? Because the term qualitative review or qualitative evidence synthesis is actually very often misused. Quantitative researchers use it actually for reviews in which uh, statistical pooling is just not an option to them. And they then summarize the information from the studies in some sort of a narrative. This is actually not a qualitative synthesis. Because the basic ingredient of that sort of synthesis is still quantitative. It remains quantitative information. And these narratives are then actually fairly descriptive in nature. They don't go beyond the descriptives into a more profound level of interpretive understanding. So you really need to be, dis be able to distinguish between these two. Now, what these qualitative evidence synthesis can do is explore questions such as how do people experience a condition or a situation? And I think I've just shown that through the examples we've discussed. Why does an intervention work or may not work? For whom? In what particular cir circumstances it does work or does not work? Uh, what are potential barriers, facilitators related to a program you're trying to uh, implement? And what impact do specific barriers and facilitators have, not only on the program, but also on the people, their experiences, their sort of behavior? So the definition of qualitative evidence synthesis is actually very close to the definition of synthesis displayed in the Oxford English Dictionary. It states that it, synthesis is actually, actually a process or result of both building up separate elements, especially ideas, into a connected whole, especially a theory or a system. And so I think that there are three components in my definition of qualitative evidence synthesis. I always call it a systematic empirical inquiry into meaning. It is systematic in the sense that qualitative evidence synthesis also have some sort of protocolized starting point. They are planned, they are ordered and structured. The process of conducting a qualitative evidence synthesis may not be as linear as a quantitative review, but what we do as an author is actually reconstruct that logic of science into some, some sort of linear uh, report of what we've done. It's empirical in the sense that it comes very close to the original intention of the word empirical, which is that it depends upon the world of our experience. It builds on what we can capture with our senses, with all of our senses. And it is by far an inquiry into meaning because we try to develop a more complex picture of a phenomenon. And that is what I've called rich, deep, thick, textured, insightful as well when I was talking about the three little pigs and the questions, the sort of questions that generated in my children. So now that we know what qualitative evidence synthesis is, it's maybe interesting to look into how it can specifically contribute to treatment effectiveness reviews. Uh, it contributes in many ways. We already learned from the pregnancy and the hair grow example that it contributes to the understanding of heterogeneity between effects and between individuals. But it can do more than that. It provides also a research-based context for interpreting and explaining your trial results. If, if we take 
pick up a set of different questions such as how to achieve change more effectively, how to improve our interventions, how to fit the subjective needs of our target group or even the ones uh, who are in charge of delivering a program, what other type of interventions might be needed to make it more successful, I think that would that overall would increase uh, a lot of the quality of the interventions we are engaged with. So it provides evidence on subjective experiences uh, of those involved in developing, delivering, receiving interventions, or even living with a particular condition or in a specific uh, vulnerable environment, for example. It can also reveal the extent to which effective interventions are actually adopted in policies and policy and practice. It engages a lot, a lot with questions of uh, related to implementation. Um, this is actually a short excerpt from our chapter 20 in the Cochrane Handbook on the role of qualitative evidence in the Cochrane Effectiveness Reviews. And as you can see, we identify four different roles of qualitative evidence synthesis. It can inform a review by using evidence from qualitative research to help define and re refine questions. We, we are very used to develop our own research questions. And in the past, before I engaged with qualitative evidence synthesis, I wasn't at all too sensitive to the fact whether or not my question was actually relevant to those uh, out in the field and those having to uh, implement what we academics were actually suggested. So via qualitative research, you can actually probe uh, people to refine your question, make it a better match um, for them. We can also enhance reviews by synthesizing evidence from qualitative research that is identified while we're actually looking at evidence of effectiveness. A lot of the RCTs we include in quantitative reviews, they actually contain some implementation or process related qualitative information that we could valorize, but that we tend to neglect too much. A lot of these studies may also have sibling studies floating around on the web uh, that are not really, that are close connected to the effectiveness question, but not actually incorporated in the same study. So we can enhance these views by actually looking at that sort of evidence. We can extend them by searching specifically for evidence from qualitative studies. Uh, to address questions that relate to effectiveness reviews but are not focused on uh, effectiveness itself. For example, did we achieve the intended outcome? Why not? Why did we achieve it? What other influences do we see that were not protocoled in advance and how can we deal with them? How can we change the program so that it uh, would be sensitive to the concerns of those in the field? Or we can also supplement effectiveness reviews by just synthesizing qualitative evidence within a sort of standalone complementary review. And in these type of reviews, we address questions on aspects other than effectiveness. Uh, for example, how do people experience living with a particular condition? And there's been a lot of drivers for that have pleaded for mixing both strands of evidence. One of them is the greater recognition of the value of qualitative research in the evidence policy uh, movement. We also have faced in the past with, uh, with a lot of empty reviews, stating like, oh, we didn't find any RCTs. And we all know how hard it is to conduct an RCT, for example, in a school setting. You can't just uh, randomize uh, pupils across interventions. You have to work with groups. So there's a lot, a lot of practical limitations that lead to these empty reviews where there's lots of evidence that could be taken uh, into account. There's also an increasing demand for an incorporation of public perspectives and experiences in those sort of reviews from funders. That has sparked the mixed methods debate. Uh, 
the, the most simple interventions within Cochrane, at least, they have long been researched and we're now facing more complex questions in the disciplinary fields um, that, that can't be uh, accessed through RCTs alone. Uh, there's a lot of interest currently in issues of process and implementation so to actually optimize programs. A lot of traditions that are growing in the primary research area, there's a lot of mixed methods, primary research, research studies coming up and these are also um, you know, used to, to motivate reviewers to take a mixed method approach. Uh, there's a lot of more funding for these types of reviews as well. And the most dedicated methods groups that have long uh, catered for qualitative evidence are actually now moving into a more uh, mixed method type of thinking. Uh, I haven't spoken about how different qualitative evidence synthesis are from reviews of effectiveness. We know the sort of questions they might ask, but there are certain differences that are more on a conceptual level, which I'd like to speak to you about. Um, and I've stolen this metaphor. I've stolen I've stolen this metaphor from um, David Gough and James Thomas. James Thomas might be one of the speakers coming up uh, in a later phase of these series. But they position quantitative and qualitative reviews as a spectrum between aggregated versus configurative types of reviews. And let's start with the easy one that everyone's familiar with which is the aggregative type of metaphor. Metaphors are really interesting because they, they make visual what we actually lack in capacity to do cognitively. So this is actually a metaphor, the pile of stones for meta-analysis, for quantitative types of reviews, because what they actually do is identify individual studies and then pooling the results of each of these studies but each of these studies in the meta-analysis remains visible. They don't tear them apart, they just create one sort of overall measure of effect across these studies. And what they do is they increase the power of uh, the measure there. And I'm not sure whether you've been hiking in Wales, for example, in the UK, but there's a lot of mist there. And what they do for hikers is they pile these stones up so that it makes it easier for people to actually find their way. This is some sort of metaphor to say like you increase the power uh, compared to just one stone lying there flat with an arrow on it. Um, the next slide is actually an example from Cochrane of uh, a quantitative bit from a mixed method review, and this review actually evaluated the impact of lay health workers in primary and community health care for maternal and child health and the management of infectious diseases. And what this review concluded as one of the main conclusions is that lay health workers can increase immunization uptake in children below the age of five years old. And you can see the parallel with the pile of stones here. You see all the individual studies on the left of your screen, the Barnes until the Rodewald study. And then you see on the right uh, hand side, you see the effect measure for each of these individual study. And at the end of the plot, you can see this diamond that actually shows that lay health workers have a positive impact on, um, on the maternal and child health. So if you look at the individual studies, the, the picture is much more confusing. Not all of them are on the same side. Not all of them have confidence intervals that fall within the positive area. It's only by pooling them that you get some sort of clear picture of where the true effect may lie. 
Now, the, the second metaphor I'd like to use is one of a mosaic, and this really links into the, the idea of configuration that is very central to qualitative evidence synthesis. What we do, we rearrange, we configure the findings of primary studies in order to sort of generate new theory or explore the salience of existing theory in particular situations. So what we actually do is piece together research knowledge from different contexts. And as you can see in that picture of the mosaic, the individual studies are no longer recognizable. We actually turn them into a new whole holistic understanding of a particular phenomenon. So it's much more diffuse what the actual role of one particular study is in this uh, sort of reviews. And what is so important in qualitative evidence synthesis is that you are very sensitive uh, to context, because what we do is we piece together research knowledge from different contexts. And you, you can't just pile that up. You need to remain sensitive to where does this evidence come from, and would it be um, generalizable to other countries or not. Just to give you one small anecdote on the role of context in our daily life. This is an anecdote I've stolen from one of my colleagues, Cynthia. She's from the US and she was telling that she was phoning her husband saying like, honey, I'm running late. Can you please put the chicken on the stove? I love you a lot and I hope he does it okay, she thought in herself. And then she came home and what she found was the chicken on the stove but not particularly in the way she had meant it, because she actually meant, I'm late, so I want you to cook dinner for us tonight. He had interpreted it as, uh, yeah, I'll just put the box on the stove, and then it's melted down uh, the moment uh, Cynthia will arrive. So there's lots of examples in our daily life where we can see that context is very important. And what strikes me the most is that in quantitative studies, we filter out context as much as possible. We create experimental studies in some sort of virtual laboratory environment. And so it's, it's remarkable that these streams not have been brought together much, much earlier uh, in history. Because we know that we can't do the one without the other to create some sort of uh, decent understanding of a phenomenon. And so what you see here is the qualitative part of that mixed method review produced by Claire Glendon on barriers and facilitations to the implementation of these lay health worker programs to improve access to maternal and child health care. And what it actually addressed uh, instead of effectiveness of these lay health workers was the program acceptability, feasibility, and appropriateness. So it looked into the lay health worker relationship with other health professionals um, and with their clients, the patient flow process, service integration, social cultural condi conditions, and so on. And the nice thing about this is that it gives a clear overview of what people like. Uh, from the point of view, from the lay health workers, from the point of view of the clients, and from the point of view of the professional workers who had actually uh, who needed to work with these lay health workers on a daily basis. And what this sort of information can contribute to the whole is that it allows you, and I'm fully aware that this is, this is very small for you to see, but on the right hand side, you see like the overall outcome of the review, improved health outcomes among mothers and children. And some of the more um, secondary outcomes like better quality services, including appropriateness of consultation services. This is actually evaluated through the quantitative one. But the nice thing is that the qualitative uh, synthesis identified a lot of negative and positive moderators in that relation between lay health workers and clients or other health professionals. For example, one of the negative moderators was that uh, health professionals were really concerned about 
their own loss of authority about the knowledge of these people and whether it would be enough. While on the positive moderator side, uh, people explained that they really liked the lay health workers because of the fact that they had more time, they were really supported, but they did fear a lack of knowledge as well, so they actually found each other in that particular bit. So what you can do is you can bring in all that qualitative evidence in your flowchart of your review and it provides you with, with a lot, with a much clearer understanding of what is actually going on. I'm going to sum this up with some of the differences between that sort of meta-analysis and meta-synthesis stream of evidence. So meta-analysis is actually trying to accumulate knowledge. The studies that you include in such a review have to be strictly comparable to be able to pull them statistically. And it aims at creating more power. Think about the, stone of pi the, the pile of stones that I've shown you earlier today. And they do that through numerical data. While the metasynthesis bit is actually trying to make sense of data. So the studies that you include, they don't have to address the complete similar account. They can be picked from different contexts, even different targets group. They need to have some sort of basic comparability on the level of the phenomenon or the topic of interest in your research. And they add value in content through interpretation. Um, so we can move on to some of the general approaches that can be used in qualitative evidence synthesis. And to me, that's a very difficult thing to do, because it used to be simple in the quants bit, where you had to choose between a random uh, or a fixed so, sort of model. Uh, to me, the approaches to qualitative evidence kind of remind me of a big, huge circus tent that hosts all these different uh, approaches. And they're very different in terms of methodologies, perspectives, strategies they use. It is really a li little bit more complex than choosing between a fixed or a random model in meta-analysis. Um, so qualitative evidence synthesis is actually just an umbrella term which encompasses many different approaches. In other words, there's room for many different types of views about qualitative evidence synthesis that can comfortably be fit uh, underneath this big tent. Um, one thing that helps you to choose between all these methods is think about what is the purpose of my qualitative evidence review. And some of the purposes can be linked to certain types of qualitative evidence synthesis. So if you're interested in bringing together separate findings into some sort of interpretive explanation, you want to generate theory, you want to bring some newness some holistic point of view, you can choose, for example, meta-ethnography. And I'm very sure that this uh, type of approach will return in some of the other lectures. It's one of the most commonly used approaches. On the other hand, if you critically approach the literature in terms of deconstructing research traditions or theoretical assumptions, if you want to critique the work of others, then critical interpretive synthesis would be something you should consider. Other reviewers like to produce theories or models that are based on their topic of interest and may involve, for example, yeah, interactive processes, contextualized understanding and action. They would rather move into grounded theory on a meta level. Uh, some data you encounter are more or less descriptive. They don't cater too much for a lot of interpretation, so then in that case, thematic analysis would be a potential option. I personally work a lot with meta-aggregation. It's um, an approach that mirrors the linear approach of quantitative reviews and summarizes evidence in order to develop lines of actions for practice and policy. But there's a lot of more complex um, review types that really try to unpick relationships between persons, environments, 
that try to formulate patterns, for example, with such an intervention, what sort of outcomes will I expect? And how do I think that links into different populations, for example, on the level of gender or different settings, schools, hospitals, and so on. There are also uh, approaches that bring together research of different designs and paradigms. Meta-narrative is an approach that caters for quantitative as well as qualitative basic uh, research, for example. So that's one area that would help you to choose. Another one is that you need to take some sort of stance epistemologically if you want to choose uh, a particular approach. And as you can see, all of these approaches are somewhere situated between a realist perspective and an idealist perspective. The idealist perspective is much closer to interpretive science the realist perspective is a bit closer to what positivists would believe in, in the sense that they uh, believe that there is some sort of external truth out there that we can search for using qualitative evidence, while idealist type of researchers would really claim that there is actually no shared reality that is independent of human construction. So that means that every synthesis, every meta-level uh, type of product is actually colored through the lens of the review author. And so depending on where you are, some of these approaches would link better to your personal position than others. And that's a different X for you to choose. So there's the purpose and the aim of your review there's the position that you have about what is knowledge and how can we generate that. And it links a bit into difference between people who are rather on the inquiry side of qualitative evidence or on the more empirical scientific side of generating qualitative evidence. So it links into that sort of debate. And then there's a few other axes you need to consider if you want to choose between approaches, that is, what sort of experience do I have in my team? And what sort of resources um, do I have? Because that's very important to, to consider. Some of these um, approaches are very complex to execute. And some require a lot more time than others. So you can actually try to um, jot down all of the information on the nature of the research, including the aims, on the resource requirements. Is it something that needs a lot of work? Is it something that works comprehensive or more purposefully? Uh, you can jot down elements on the nature of your research theme. What sort of experience do I have? Do I have quantitative researchers who want to do qualitative synthesis? Or do I have real experts that could move us along that interpretive side of meta-analysis. And there's the nature of researchers. How much structure do I prefer? Do I prefer a linear approach? Am I comfortable with iterative, non-linear approaches to evidence synthesis and so on? And based on the arguments between each of these categories, you can then choose the approaches that my colleagues are going to outline in the next uh, series of lectures. This whole choosing process is actually outlined in one of the books we produced um, with some of the colleagues of my methods group. It's available and we also have a mail base from the Cochrane Qualitative Implementation Methods Group where people can actually post questions for discussion um, if you're stuck in choosing things, if you're stuck in definitions, you don't know how to approach things, sometimes people post um, questions to us and we do our best to try and answer those as well. So for the final part of this presentation, which is probably the most boring part as well, I'm sorry for that, I'd like to run you through a couple of slides outlining how to protocolize uh, qualitative evidence synthesis. And uh, I'm borrowing, borrowing some slides from many of my colleagues working in the methods group, 
uh, including slides from Jenny Poppe, Andrew Boots, and Janet Harris, uh, who have inspired me a lot in uh, the last years. So just defining what a protocol is, um, let me just pick out the most uh, comprehensive definition of a protocol uh, portrayed by uh, the Cochrane collaboration. It's a plan or set of steps to be followed in a study. So a protocol for a systematic review should first of all describe the rationale for the review, the objectives, and uh, the specific methods that will be used to locate, select, and critically appraise studies. It also outlines details about how to collect and how you plan to analyze data from the included studies. So most protocols follow some sort of linear outline. It starts with uh, the scoping of a the literature, then outlines a rationale for the review. It describes the condition, the situation you are interested in. It describes the intervention or your phenomenon of interest. Uh, and above all, it's uh, required to actually state why it is important to do a particular review. And that can be theoretically, in, theoretically inspired or practically inspired. It then sets out to formulate the question and sets objectives. It works with predefined inclusion criteria that evaluate the relevance of a particular study that has been retrieved through a search for uh, the objectives of the review and the criteria mainly link into population you're interested in, again your phenomenon, and the sort of studies you intend to um, include. You then outline your search strategy in terms of which databases you want to use and which key terms you think of using uh, to retrieve uh, relevant articles. And it, it's it stops with actually outlining methods for data collection and analysis and with anticipating on how your results will visually be presented. Now, the difference uh, between quantitative and qualitative protocols is that quantitative protocols are always uh, linear. Uh, a priori protocols in qualitative evidence instances are seldom as linear as they are presented in the previous outline or even in the reports uh, people write. Because many of these reviewers opt actually for non-comprehensive or maybe even purposeful samples of literature based on an initial set of key papers from which the rest of the relevant papers is then generated through some sort of snowball sample. So the questions of a qualitative evidence synthesis may even be adapted based on initial review findings and inclusion criteria. So what we actually do is we reconstruct or rather iterative logic into some sort of linear structure that is required in the most research reports. This is not to say that qual reviewers never use a linear approach, only that we are convinced that it is not the best way forward for every sort of uh, review. And that's an important thing uh, to know, I guess. Um, and the iterative process is actually the cause of trying to develop theory. And theory cannot be developed from uh, some sort of fixed perspective. Theory is built on components that are brought in in different phases of the review. Hence, that explains the iterative process that we often go to. So let's start with this initial phase of scoping the literature. That's pretty much, much the same concept for effectiveness reviews and qualitative evidence synthesis. We kind of search using a first set of key terms that we think is relevant to generate uh, the right articles for our review. And it kind of gives us an overview of the amount of literature, the diversity in the population interventions and outcomes we come across, 
and it gives us an indication on how we can define our uh, review question. So for effectiveness reviews, it kind of sets out priori limits uh, for uh, the inclusion criteria. And the thing with effectiveness reviews then is that they don't deviate anymore once these criteria or elements of population intervention and outcome are defined. So they stick to the same definitions of these uh, concepts through root screening uh, the articles. Qualitative evidence on the, under, on the other side actually uses the scoping literature already as a starting point to start an, analyzing uh, data and then the information from the scoping review becomes part of the key papers that are extracted. Providing a rationale in an effectiveness review really relates to describing the condition or the situation, describing the intervention you're interested in, and justifying the importance of compiling evidence of um, effectiveness. The same counts for qualitative evidence synthesis. Uh, we rather describe experiences and attitudes, behaviors related to a certain condition or a situation or even the reactions of the target group to interventions that have already been tested out and need to be improved. So that's a way of trying to justify why it's important to compile evidence, qualitative evidence, that may explain um, heterogeneity, for example, in effectiveness reviews. So the Lewin and Glanton reviews, the ones on lay health workers, I've incorporated an example of how they actually position their uh, rationale. And for the effectiveness part, it was situated in chronic shortage of health workers, increasing the need for treatment, um, and into task shifting to alleviate the demand on doctors and nurses who are currently heavily loaded. So that's why uh, this review uh, needed to be done to actually explore the potential of these lay health workers. Um, the qualitative evidence synthesis started from the same situation, but the rationale was different in the sense that they framed the review in trying to explain the effects identified in the effectiveness review that was already conducted at the moment the qualitative evidence synthesis was done. Formulating a question for effectiveness reviews is often based on the the PICO acronym, which actually requires review authors to define their population, their intervention, comparison uh, for interventions like the control uh, groups and the outcomes they are interested in, while qualitative evidence synthesis would more go into questions of how, why a particular intervention works for some people and doesn't work for others. So it's very much oriented towards exploring particular phenomenon that is relevant to the population intervention or outcome described in the effectiveness review. Again, this is the way it has been done in the lay health worker review. So their question and objectives related to effectiveness of lay health worker interventions in primary and community health care on maternal and child health. And then if you compare that with the qualitative evidence bit, you see that they were actually interested in exploring factors affecting the impl implementation of lay health worker programs for maternal and child health. So they actually identified barriers and facilitators to the implementation process and tried to integrate these findings with the, uh, with the results of the effect review and that actually helped to enhance and extend the understanding of how these complex interventions may work and how context actually impacted on uh, the implementation. In setting criteria for inclusion, uh, there's some sort of standard procedure there for effectiveness reviews. What you should describe is what type of studies you include. You would provide detailed definitions and parameters for both the population and the intervention. You would set out parameters on primary and secondary outcomes where secondary outcomes might be relevant. 
and you sort of take a position into what sort of quality measurement that you would include uh, on the studies that you have that you have to treat. And in effectiveness reviews, that's very important because they sort of have the stand that if you put crap in, then the overall effect will be crap as well. So they're very sensitive to the methodological quality of the trials and other quantitative studies that they include. The qualitative evidence synthesis, on the other hand, they often include all sorts of qualitative methodologies. Uh, they may limit it to particular methodologies or types of papers. I'm aware of many reviews that uh, exclude, for example, opinion papers because they don't consider that empirical qualitative research. Some would only address ethnographic studies and would neglect, for example, action research. So there's a lot of decision points to make there. Um, it's best that the population that you search, research, matches somehow that of the effectiveness review, although you can include broader uh, or other populations as well, if you like. Outcomes are not really the phenomenon of interest here. Um, we describe our outcome mainly in terms of experiences. And quality is not as important as relevance in qualitative reviews. So if we judge whether an article should be in or out, then we basically judge how relevant the insight of the article are, how insightful, how illuminated they are uh, to help us formulate or generate theory. And we do adopt articles that may have certain methodological flaws as long as they are minor enough not to affect the credibility of uh, the overall theory. So for the Lay Health Workers Review, uh, they opted for the inclusion of RCTs only in the quantitative strand. But they applied a broad definition of qualitative studies, included all sorts of studies that use qualitative methods for the qualitative evidence trend. Uh, if you look at uh, the criteria for inclusion that have been chosen by uh, the review authors, then you can see that they considered any lay health worker paid or voluntary, including community health workers, village health workers, birth dependents, peer counselors, etc. We they also defined the term lay health worker as any health worker who performed functions related to healthcare delivery, was trained and had received no formal professional uh, certificate. So as you can see it's very much operationalized uh, and that really helps your second screener to actually evaluate whether a particular article should be in based on the population or not. Uh, for the qualitative bit, they used the same criteria, but they expanded the stakeholders to include uh, family members, patients them themselves, policymakers, and so on, and they included their perspectives and opinions as well on uh, the topic. So here, this is an example of broadening your uh, target group. Considering the intervention, the effectiveness review uh, actually considered any intervention delivered by lay health workers intended to improve maternal and child health care. So child health uh, was operationalized as children aged less than five years, and maternal health was health care aimed at improving reproductive health, ensuring safe motherhood, or women in their role as carers for children aged less than five years. So that really sets the boundaries of a review because the authors could have included uh, many more uh, outcome measures uh, on the level of maternal or child health. On the qualitative side, they took a broader intake like programs that intend to improve maternal or child health and that use any type of lay health worker, including community health workers and the whole batch that have been considered in the effectiveness review as well. Um, 
here you can see uh, a division between primary outcomes, and the next slide will uh, go into secondary outcomes of the effectiveness review, uh, like, for example, health behaviors, type of care plan agreed, adherence to care plans, etc. Healthcare outcomes as assessed by a variety of measures, and these may include mortality, physiological me measures, uh, also participant self-reports of symptom resolution, quality of life, and the classical ones on patient self-esteem. What is worthwhile to mention is that this review also included outcome measures related to harms or adverse effects. And sometimes that's a role that qualitative evidence synthesis may pick up as well. So if you look at the outcomes defined for the qualitative review, you can see that it includes studies where the phenomenon of interest is a description and interpretation of what I already mentioned, experiences and attitudes of stakeholders toward these uh, lay health work programs. Now we move into the plan for searching. Uh, what you need to define in your search strategy is first of all a list of sources that you will be consulting and most of the time this is uh, major electronic databases that have been identified within your specific uh, scientific fields, topped on with grey literature and that may include for, include, for example master dissertations, uh, abstracts of Congress that you could chase the author from, uh, but also author contact. Uh, a really useful thing to do is uh, if you have papers that are really top on, what I often do is contact the author to see whether he is, has any other studies related to the topic uh, lying in his desk that may not have been published, and sometimes you get positive responses for that. You also define search term, and if you want, you can use filters uh, that sift out particular um, designs, such as RCTs only or qualitative evidence only. You then set date and language limits, and it's very important that these limits are actually preferably theoretically inspired, because most of the people take a cutoff of 10 years based on arguments that are really too pragmatic, for example, lack of time. Sometimes you find example of review, examples of review authors that um, state that, well, I, I started in 2010 because that was when this particular intervention has been published on the first time. So they actually define some sort of theoretical criterion for a cutoff in date. Um, for qualitative evidence synthesis, the sources may differ. Uh, there's a famous study from Trisha Greenaut in which she tested how much evidence that was uh, retrieved via major databases, and it was only 30% of the relevant studies that were retrieved through major databases. So a lot more work, more work needs to be done to actually chase the grey literature on qualitative studies. And actually that's our own fault, because we tend to use these very creative titles to position our qualitative basic research papers, and that's very interesting. But the titles, nor the index terms, give us any indication of whether or not it is qualitative. So that leads to the fact that these studies are often not indexed as qualitative studies and, and so hard to retrieve. So you, might, you may need to contact more people to generate uh, evidence, particularly when what you found is really thin in uh, level of description. So here's an example of a search strategy developed for the lay health worker review. As you can see, they actually captured a lot, a lot of databases here. Uh, the qualitative evidence synthesis used the same uh, sort of databases, but the filters differed. So for retrieving the RCTs, uh, a filter um, incorporated in PubMed or Medline was actually used. And uh, for the qualitative review, they also filtered out only qualitative studies using pre-specified filters in these particular databases. 
And then there's the selection of studies. You actually screen uh, preferably with two independent uh, screeners. You screen all the retrieved studies through your search strategy for relevance, for inclusion. And that is done based on titles and abstracts. Um, and you actually share your inclusion and ex exclusion criteria you, de you defined with your second uh, reviewer so that he can clearly see, OK, I need to evaluate this type of abstract based on these particular in and exclusion criteria. As such, if it's not at all clear whether it should be in or out, you then retrieve a full text and you look into the full text and then you make an overall judgment of whether it should be included. And often you have conflicts between screeners on whether something should be in or out. So you can ask a senior researcher to actually be a judge on that and look at the article with a fresh perspective to actually solve these sort of in or out uh, conflicts. The same strategy is used in qualitative evidence synthesis. Uh, relevance, though, may be interpreted a bit more broadly. Uh, and in a situation where relevance is a bit uncertain, then maybe we would place these studies in some sort of holding pile and return to them later because they might be interesting to actually create a comprehensive um, theory. Now, the next phase is then that you should describe how you're going to appraise the study quality. In an effectiveness review that is produced within Cochrane, they actually always use the similar quality framework that is outlined in the Cochrane handbook on uh, reviews of effectiveness. And it's based on some sort of quality measurements uh, related to sequence generation, concealment of allocation, blinding of data, and so on. We already discussed that bias is not always an issue in qualitative research. Relevance counts a bit more uh, in that sort of uh, evidence trends. So the criteria that uh, qualitative reviewers use may also differ. There's no such thing as a standard instrument that you could turn to. Uh, there's lots and lots of variants uh, on the market and I think you need to decide what type of criteria you are comfortable with and how they actually fit your own personal review project. Um, in the lay health worker review, um, for the Effectiveness bit, they use the Cochrane um, instrument to assess risk of bias. For the qualitative bit, they use the, the qualitative assessment instrument from the Critical Appraisal Skills Program. Uh, I've published an article in which different online appraisal instruments are assessed based on their ability to assess validity in qualitative research, and it kind of outlines the pros and cons of, for example, the CASP instrument uh, compared to the Joanna Briggs instrument on quality uh, appraisal that is also often used by uh, qualitative researchers. So you may want to look into that article to make a final decision. Both strands uh, engage in the assessment of heterogeneity. In effectiveness reviews, we actually try to look at the effect of, or to look at what happens when we remove low quality articles from our set or from our pile and we evaluate whether it changes the effectiveness measure or the overall outcome at all. We adopt the same uh, logic in qualitative evidence synthesis in the sense that for a sensitivity analysis we actually remove all the findings generated from low methodologically quality articles and we try to evaluate whether that changes our theory or whether that changes our line of argument at all. It's some sort of a test that we incorporate in our reviews to see what the effect of low versus high quality um, studies is. Now, data synthesis, that's a complex issue because for effectiveness reviews, we usually group according to similarities in population intervention and outcomes, and we compile an overall uh, effectiveness, measure of effectiveness. 
But for the qualitative bit, you have this whole range of qualitative methods that you need to choose from. I've given you the choice points already, and my colleagues in the upcoming talks, they will go into the details of all these uh, different uh, options for you. But in a sense, you need to be able to justify your choice of method, and that justification should be in your protocol. Again, the work example from the lay health worker group, uh, they didn't define grouping of studies a priori. The studies were grouped within the review by type of health issue, and so that was their major uh, focus in that protocol. And uh, for the qualitative bit, the protocol mentioned that a thematic analysis approach would be used used uh, because they sort of sense that the articles that were retrieved were really thin in description, so they wouldn't really allow for an interpretive account that would lead them in a real theory. To sum up this whole bit, um, I think when I'm looking at the quant researchers, I'm using information from, and the qual researchers, I'm using information from in my reviews on the meta level. I always call the quant researchers my masters of the window because they measure what they can see. They hypothesize and they're very linear in their approach. And so that helps me in my synthesis. It makes the whole process very transparent. But I call my qual researchers, which I include studies, my masters of the lantern because they search for light in places where no one else has gone before. They sort of wander around in the difficult issues, the things that we can't express in numbers, in sort of an iterative fashion, with the sole purpose, actually, to illuminate, to try to better understand. And my goal as a reviewer is to try and do justice to both of them by creating review teams that have enough methodological expertise for mixing these apples with oranges. And I think uh, I'm going to close my talk here. I think I've talked way too much. And thank you for having me. And I'm really happy to respond to any of the questions that I may have provoked through my talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Karen. That was a wonderful presentation. I also want to thank everyone for participating today. We hope you found the session to be informative and that you will join us for the next three webinars. As you can see on the final slide, we have a link to a brief evaluation form and would really appreciate your input. We will also be sending an email with the link for the evaluation. On this final note, I would like to conclude today's webinar with a big thank you to our speaker, Karen Hannes, from myself, Ann Williams, and all of the staff at the KTDRR. We appreciate the support from NIDR to carry out the webinars and other activities. And we look forward to your participation in the following sessions. Thank you.